Good afternoon, everybody, and hello to the TV audience watching on CVTV. I'm proud to put my name on the ballot for 17th LD State Representative. I'm a lifelong resident of East Vancouver and proud of my family roots here in Clark County. When looking at wanting to be a state representative, you have to ask yourself, what does your heart say? What does your mind say? How can you better inform the citizens of what goes on in Olympia? What type of policies and legislation do we need that affects all our families, all our working families? That is why I put my name forward. I believe that our 17th LD deserves great representation in Olympia, and I'm proud to be here this afternoon to share my thoughts and feelings with you all today. Thank you. I say thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this on today. It is a great service to our community. I'm Vicki Kraft. I am your current state representative for the 17th Legislative District, one of two of them. And uh, it has been my pleasure and honor to be serving you. Uh, I basically, by way of background, um, very thankful. I have roots here in Washington. My mom's from Yakima. Uh, dad came out in the Army, Fort Lewis, met mom, went back to Michigan, uh, raised there. But I ended up coming back here. And so uh, it's been great to be here. Uh, really, for me, it's about making sure that the government is serving the citizens, making sure that it's doing so effectively and efficiently. And so I look forward to taking this time this afternoon to share more with you about the issues. Thanks. Well, thank you. I, I've been really fortunate to be able to volunteer with the Boys and Girls Club, uh, specifically in Hazel Dell. Kids are really one of the key reasons I decided to run for this office. Um, I have been contemplating this for years. Uh, so in short, basically all the way back to early 2000s is when I literally, I had a, a burden for youth. And as I got more involved in politics and looking at it and realizing, you know, yes, government affects our youth, but it affects all of us as we grow older as well. And so um, I've been very thankful to be able to volunteer there. Um, I think certainly the Boys and Girls Club, I picked them because they impact a really unique section of student population. Um, I've also gotten more involved recently with Teach One to Lead One, um, if you're familiar with them, and they also help with mentoring uh, students in our, some of our schools here locally and in different uh, states across our nation. So um, I've been really thankful to be able to do that. I've been involved in many different local organizations throughout my time here in Clark County. I currently work at the YWCA Clark County, but before that I was a volunteer. And as you know, the Clark County, YWCA Clark County is a social justice program. But one thing that I am very most proud of in terms of all my community involvement throughout the years is being the co-chair of the Evergreen um, Citizens for Schools School of Facilities Bond this past February. We passed the largest school bond in Washington State history, $695 million. That goes to replace schools and build new schools and improve technology for our students in the Evergreen School District. And it was a joint effort. It was a community effort. We had um, support from labor, from business, from our elected officials who were not afraid to put their name on something that says, yes, we believe in our schools, we believe in our kids. So I'm very proud of that community involvement. Also been involved in the Southern Poverty Law Center, which promotes the rights, civil rights of all individuals, voting rights, civil rights, our immigrant community too. So my community involvement has centered around children, kids, and also our civil rights community as well. Very proud of that work. Thank you. I think it's an important question that not only is Clark County facing, but many counties around our state are facing. I appreciate um, the emphasis on local control. It's important that our cities and our counties have a voice when it comes to the State um, Management Act. I also would like to see, especially here in the 17th, we have both an urban and suburban and rural populations too. So it's critical that the voices of Richfield, Battleground and Vancouver have a voice on that. We can't really, I can't really say specific issues because I would want to focus in on what each of those cities and areas, what it entails to, but we also need to keep in mind what the intent of the act is, to promote healthy, thoughtful planning for our communities and also helping our business community as well. 
as we our population is growing, different businesses are going to be coming in and out. And so we need to understand how does that predict um, how does that affect business predictability as well too. So again, it's going back to focusing on the cities and the communities within the 17th and what role do they play and coming together both as county, city, and also then state officials to do what's best for our community. Thank you. Well, when you look at the um, State Growth Management Act, you are looking at it at a state level. It literally will impact the entire state. So um, you have to keep that in mind as a starting point when you look at this policy issue. And um, I would definitely be in favor of looking at uh, potentially easing some of those urban growth boundaries, right? Because we do have some challenges that we are facing as a result, I believe, of that right now. Um, I definitely want to make sure we are protecting our rural communities. Um, you know, I was just talking with someone the other day, it was at their house, and it was really in a beautiful rural area in Hawkinson. And so I absolutely am mindful that, you know, we are in the 17th, and it is not all downtown, and it's not all rural. So we do need to absolutely realize there are some um, nuances that we're going to have to face in looking at this policy. And um, I think we saw some of that play out here at the county level about two years ago. Um, but the reality is when you're looking at making these type of policy changes, it's impacting the state. So, um, you know, again, those, those are some realities. But uh, I do think we need to look at, you know, some easing there and make sure that the management is appropriate. Thank you. In dealing with affordable housing, so many of us are at different income levels, the type of jobs that we have. And depending on what income level we are at, we'll determine what type of house we can afford. We're not just talking about McMansions or four hundred or $500,000 homes. We're talking about apartments or consider affordable housing. We're considering housing such as townhomes and condominiums, but also single family homes as well too. I think there should be some incentives given to developers to include affordable housing units in the developments. There's a huge development going um, up where I live off of 112th and 18th Street, and people are asking me, how many homes are gonna fit in there? And what's the price of those homes, of those apartments? We have to look at everybody who this affects when it comes to affordable housing. There was some legislation this year in Olympia about rent control too. It died in committee, so it didn't get to the floor, but that's something that we might have to look at too. Also, eviction notices too. 20, 30 days is not acceptable for so many of our families who do live paycheck to paycheck and who get that eviction notice with no fault of their own. So there's a lot of things that we can do, but we have to keep in mind that this affects all families at all income levels. Thank you. Well, this is perfect because it just builds on what, it, what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. So to me, affordable housing, um, one of the dynamics that is causing that is, in my opinion, the lack of supply that we have. And some of that is absolutely, I believe, due to lack of land available to build. Um, we obviously have been through a really dry season here in the 2009-ish time frame. There wasn't a lot of building going, um, but now uh, it's booming, right? And we in Clark County are seeing a tremendous amount of um, building going on. And wherever there's a plot of land, it seems like it gets snatched up quick and there's houses or, you know, uh, home communities going up on that quickly. So, um, you know, when it comes to affordable housing, there's a few things I think we need to look at. One is the urban growth boundary, as I mentioned before. Two is permitting um, cost, the fee to developers, and the process. Because ultimately, the longer the permitting process is, that's more cost to the builders. And in 2016, if you would look at the Builders Industry Association website from Clark County, it literally said 71 thousand dollars of every new home price is directly related to government regulations or fees that's a lot and when we talk about you know 
um, certainly a uh, new young couple trying to build, uh, you know, get into a home. You talk about somebody who's got a good working wage job trying to get into their first town home. You know, those are real costs that go in. So um, those are some of the things absolutely I think we need to work, work on and change. I think a lot of us were glad to see us deal with McClary finally. It's been going on for a number of years, but there's still a lot of work to be done. That's one area that I would like to see when it comes to funding public education is that emphasis on special education and pre and pre kindergarten. We could even look past high school and go post high school, our technical community colleges as well, our apprenticeship programs. That is something that the state, those in the Olympia are going to have to look at. Are we truly funding public education? Are we look are we funding every single type of program? that can benefit all of our children at all levels of learning. We also need to look at what it's doing in terms of our staff, our teachers, our administration, our classified staff. That's all part of funding public education. We might have to have a McCleary 2.0 coming up too. And that includes getting input and feedback from our teachers, from our administrators, from our school board members, from our PTOs and PTAs. We also are looking at upcoming bonds and school levies across the state as well. How will McCleary going forward affect, affect those school districts? And especially those school districts that have more means, a higher tax value, and also those school districts that are struggling too. There's a lot more that we need to do. Thank you. Well, um, as, uh, as probably many of you in this room especially know, McCleary was a very, and I mean, still is, thankfully it's been addressed, but it is a very difficult issue, and it was not easy, and that's why legislatures prior to me, right, I've served my first term, uh, kicked it for 10 years, roughly. And so... The good news is because you know, the state Supreme Court said you have to fully fund the public education legislature at the state level. Okay, we addressed that. And in 2017, well, and even in the prior term, I mean, you had significant additional monies to the tune of about $7 billion go into education, K-12 education, over you know, that period of time from about 2014, 15, 16, probably 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, and so the bottom line is there's already been a significant amount of money that has been put in to specifically address McCleary. And with McCleary now, um, essentially 52%, 52% of your taxpayer dollars in the general fund in the state go specifically to K-12 education. And that is a result of McCleary. So it has been addressed. We did, according to the Washington State Supreme Court, as of the 2017 session, we, they said that, yes, you have met the McCleary mandate. You have satisfied it. They wanted more money sooner to hit this year. So that actually did get approved. But at this point, you, you don't want additional McCleary 2.0 um, because it will cost you more money. So... At this point, we're, we're hopeful that uh, we're done. <laughs> we'll still be watching it for sure. Thanks. Thank you. I, I think probably both Representative Kraft and I, we have different backgrounds, but because of our backgrounds, we come knowing what we want to work on, what we think, feel is, is best for the community and for our, our neighborhoods too. For me, my background centers around education, children's issues, health care, mental health, mental health services, therapy services. Um, working at the YWCA, we have a lot of emphasis on prevention of domestic violence and sexual assault. And a lot of the programs and monies that we receive um, from the state, you know, we are grateful for those, for that money too, but then it's about the programs and the laws around that. Too. So for me, those are some of the issues that I would definitely want to focus on. I know this past year I've been able to have a number of conversations with Representative Paul Harris, who's in position two, and he's him being very supportive of mental health services. I work with children in foster care. So that is a crucial piece for their healing, 
is mental health services. And I'm proud to have conversations and support from Paul Harris on issues um, surrounding children's mental health. Well, I mean, there's a lot. I, I introduced that or other. I introduced 14 bills just this your session in 2018. I don't recommend that. That's a lot for a freshman legislator. But um, I'll hit some of the key issues that I feel like you know uh, you need to know about specifically. And you can visit my website, certainly a legislative website, to see all the bills that I've been working on. Um, my first bill passed in the legislature, I was very thankful, it was to help our disabled veterans with the sales tax credit for adaptive housing. So a way to say thank you to those who you know, have served us, been willing to put their life on the line, and for these people specifically, they've paid a cost. Part of their body came back missing. Um, a couple other things. I was very fortunate as a freshman legislator in 2017. I came in wanting to work on sex trafficking prevention. That was something going in to the legislature I wanted to work on. Um, and I was thankful I got to um, connect with Representative Tina Orwall, who is the champion in the House for this issue. She's a Democrat. And I said, you know, Tina, I really want to work on this issue with you. And she said, you know what, if you'll start the group, I'll run on that with you. And we have. So we have about 10 bipartisan members, uh, Democrat, Republican, working together to tackle this issue. Um, a couple other things. Reducing I-5 congestion, I have been working on that. I think that is something that we need to really move ahead on. I'm sure everybody could groan or state the same. So anyway, those are those are just a few really quick things. Um, I'm happy to talk and answer other questions later. Thanks. I think everybody is probably thinking of the Boeing contract. I think when you go, when you enter a contract and you sign that contract, that is your word. There are specific conditions within that contract that you need to follow. That you've given your word to your employees. You've given your word to those employees' families. Because those are jobs, those are livelihoods on the line too. I feel that if you break the contract, it's back to the negotiation table. To get that contract back to where it needs to be, to, for it to be effective. And if you cannot do that, you can pull those incentives that are given to those co corporations, those companies. What makes a good corporate citizen? One who puts people over profits, but still can make, can, can still have those profits for their company. Can still see their stocks <coughs> rise, but always putting the people first, or the corporate profits. That's what makes a good corporate citizen. I think one of the things to realize, uh, you know, because a lot of people, you do, you ask this question in Washington, everybody goes, Boeing, bad, bad player. I'm going to tell you something. I actually took a tour there for the first time ever um, over this last year, and I wish I had it up in front of me, but if you want to go to my Facebook page and dig, probably about a good six months back, maybe nine, um, here's the reality. So, yep, we give them tax breaks. And I wish I had, I don't have this off the top of my head, but it is in that Facebook post. And um, for any of you who might know Paulina Oberg, I was actually addressing this question for her. And I was, I was glad to be, have the opportunity. I ran through in that post the thousands of jobs they create and have created over years in our state, right? One of the top employers. Um, the community hours, volunteers, monies donated back that they give. It's millions and thousands of hours. I mean, y'all, the things that they are doing are tremendous. And so if, if we, in some cases, right, if we don't offer those incentives, Boeing's gone. Can I say Amazon for a moment? Anybody familiar with what's going on with that? Seattle decided to thump them on the head and not make it attractive for them to be here. Guess what? They are leaving. The negotiations, I actually had discussions that there were no challenges, frankly, that Boeing didn't renege on, but that's out in the atmosphere. So let me just go there. Labor needs to be a good player also. Okay? So it's a two-sided, uh, it's a, it's a, both partners have to walk that well and have to not try to uncle each other. And you know what? If somebody else doesn't say to their side of the bargain, you bet. You know what? If it's better to, you know, we don't have a good economy here, they're gone. Thank so, you. So, thank you. 
I do support campaign finance reform, and as Ms. Kraft said that labor money would be supporting my candidacy, I can say that corporate money would be supporting her candidacy, awesome. and you know we it's a, we'd be a back and forth as to um, whose money is better, but whose money represents what, whose rep money represents whom. Does that, who does that money represent? What type of families does it represent? What type of communities does it represent? And is it local? Is it here in Clark County? Does it come from the 17th? Does it come from people within our state who know that we are making important decisions in Olympia, not just for our communities, but for our ent entire state too? There's a lot of suggestions. We always hear about Citizens United. But also too, we have to look at you know, do we go to publicly funded elections? There's many options and many choices out there, but we're going to have to decide for ourselves. Lifelong resident of 17th LD, I've seen millions of dollars poured into 17th LD races just in the last three election cycles. And we'll probably see it again in this election cycle as well, too. But I would ask that both myself and Ms. Kraft, we rise above whatever that money that might be coming and those special interests and stay focused on the people that we want to represent for our 17th. Thank you. Yeah, so this is so pertinent. Um, I was just named ranking member for the state government elections and IT committee and I've been serving as the assistant ranking member. So I see... Um, many, some, whichever amount, uh, of these type of bills that are coming through. In this question specifically, I mean, I think it comes down to what type of reform. A lot of people talk about corporate finance, corporate finance, get that out of there. I go back again to what I just said. Labor money, labor money, taxpayer labor money, then that needs to go too. I mean, I'm just telling you, right? If I'm sitting here as a candidate, all the labor money is going to help my opponent, which Good for her, <laughs> you know? But that's why, again, this is a two-sided coin. And that's where we really, if we're talking about reform, we need to get real about this conversation. Um, and so, at any rate, yes, I mean, I, I will be hearing some of these bills. Uh, again, it depends on what type of reform. Um, I think the initiative process in particular is somewhere that we really have to look. There's a ton of out-of-state money that comes in and dumps into whether it's the initiative process or an election, right? There's special interest uh, groups, people on both our sides, right? They just go whoop and they dump in and, you know, is that really fair to us as citizens here in Washington, right? It's influencing elections and outcomes for us with people that don't live here weighing in. So, um, and I'm not talking about personal contributions, you know, $1,000 limits. So, thanks. Well, I want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum. I grew up in a family where um, civic engagement was critical and crucial. Registering to vote when you're 18 and voting every single election since then is important. Presidential, state, county, city council, school board, you name it. You don't miss any election. And that, for me, is what public service is all about. I sit here today wearing this pride bracelet. This weekend, we're celebrating pride in the park in Clark County. And yes, I am a strong ally supporter of our LGBTQ plus community. But as I've said before, I'm also a proud supporter and ally of our immigrant community, our communities of color, our religious communities. I come from a Baptist Catholic family. Religious freedom is very important to us. And you throw in some Seventh-day Adventists and our Muslims too. Our 17th deserves a representative who is inclusive, open-minded, and will not turn their back or look down on anybody. I respectfully ask for your vote both in August and November. I'm Tanisha Harris, thank you. Real quick by way of background, because I didn't get into much of it. I have 20 years of private sector experience. I also did um, have my own business as a uh, grant writer, serving nonprofits, you know, help those helping me. Need. 
Um, I want to just address a couple comments here in closing. Um, I think I have mentioned to you earlier, I, I work bipartisan. The Disabled Vets Bill actually passed unanimously through the House and Senate, save one uh, representative who she's like, I just don't vote for any sales tax credits, but it's a good bill. Um, and I also started the Bipartisan uh, Sex Trafficking Prevention Caucus. So I think I've proven I can work across the aisle. Uh, I don't look down on anybody. I've met with groups, including transgender communities. I, in, in Olympia, I have met with um, low housing. I have met with um, those representing non-citizens. And does it mean I always agree with them? No, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that it does. But I absolutely believe as a legislator, I've been to WEA town halls, I've sat down, I've met with SEIU. So I just want you all to know, I mean, yes, I, I go to church. I go to Evergreen Bible Church. But that, in my, what I, my, <laughs> what I'm instructed to do is love one another as I love myself. Doesn't mean I have to agree with everybody else, but it, it does mean I need to treat them with respect and I would ask for the same back. Yeah, so I just, I really appreciate the time today. And again, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you. Thank you.